Good afternoon. Salam alaikum. Eid al Aha for uh, uh, 2 billion Muslims uh, worldwide uh, on this uh, blessed uh, holy day to you and your family and uh, all uh, of the Muslim uh, adherents to the Islamic faith uh, globally. <clears throat> My name is uh, Dr. John Duke Anthony. I'm the founding president of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. This is our 40th year uh, of existence there, and we will be having a gala this coming November uh, 16th uh, at the uh, Willard Hotel uh, in Washington, D.C., and we want uh, each of you to uh, circle your calendar and uh, plan on uh, attending and being present there for a one-of-a-kind uh, situation. 40-year uh, anniversaries uh, come, but once every 40 years. And so we're proud that we've made it this far. Our vision was to place this relationship between the United States and its Arab uh, friends, its Arab uh, partners, its, its Arab uh, allies on as uh, firm a foundation as possible. Firmer than it has been, firmer than it is, firmer than it is likely to be, unless we all pitch in from our various sectors on the Arab side and the American side to bring about uh, this uh, objective. Uh, our mission is one word, and, and that is education. And uh, this morning, this is exactly uh, what we're engaged in. Uh, we are going to have what we like to call a cerebral massage. And those who are going to help us do this, each and every one of them is either a product of or an associate with or, an, or a close acquaintance with the National Council on U.S.-Arab uh, Relations, either as a member of our board of directors, either as a, a former uh, employee, um, uh, either as a distinguished uh, National Council uh, uh, fellow. Uh, so we have the privilege of having uh, Colonel David DeRoche uh, to moderate this session and to introduce uh, our keynote uh, speaker, Sheikh Nawaf Al Thani of the state of Qatar, uh, who is a member of the International Advisory uh, committee uh, and uh, with whom we have had uh, close relationships now for some time. We went to uh, my alma mater uh, together this last fall, and also to uh, David DeRoche's alma mater this last fall, and where Abbas Dahouk uh, was a former professor this last fall, and uh, where we uh, had Sheikh Nawaf speak at the National Council's annual policymakers conference, Arab US policymakers conference. So we have quite a team. And a theme of this uh, focus of uh, this morning's session is whether the United States is pivoting or, or remaining in place. Uh, uh, close to 10 years ago, uh, there was a statement quoted in one of the magazines in the foreign affairs community that uh, quoted uh, then President Barack Obama saying that uh, a number of our friends in the Arabia and the Gulf region were getting a free ride. And this provoked a, a strong uh, visceral reaction from our partners and friends and allies in that region, uh, almost how dare you? Uh, look at the facts. Facts are stubborn things. And, and facts uh, have implications for policy, for positions, for actions, for a uh, attitudes. We're still hung up with that particular phrase, uh, pivoting uh, away uh, from uh, Arabia and the Gulf, 
uh, towards uh, East Arabia, uh, Southeast uh, Arabia. Uh, we will pull the veil away from this this morning and focus on not just the reality of the current play of the game and the situation and reality, but also focus on the concept of trends. Trends. People who are in the defense and aerospace industry are long-term players as well as short and medium-term players. And so I'm old enough and young enough. Some days it's difficult to determine which one is which. Uh, but I can recall at the end of the Iran-Iraq war, no, earlier than that, at the end of the October 73 war, there was a question of, all right, now, the uh, Arab uh, armies in the eastern Mediterranean have been resoundingly defeated uh, by Israel. What is likely to be the situation for the next 20 years? Where are the phrases of threats likely to come from? And the GCC countries then uh, asked the United States and Great Britain, would you do a year-long survey to determine where are we most likely to be vulnerable to threats over the next 20 years. The United States came out with the conclusion, you're going to be vulnerable from the north, from Iraq and Iran, and possibly an invasion of Kuwait, and you're going to be vulnerable from the south in terms of instability and insecurity across the border from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and sure enough, on August the 2nd, uh, almost an anniversary coming up here of 1990, Iraq rolled into Kuwait. And my goodness, imagine what would have been the case had there not been 20 years of preparations to address that trend. $20 billion of the United States Corps of Engineers was spent to put into place the relevant military infrastructure that would be able to cope with and counter a threat that might come from either, let alone both of those two theaters. And to focus on this and to provide us background context and perspective, Colonel David DeRoche, who is a distinguished uh, national counsel uh, on U.S. Arab relations, uh, national security and defense, Affairs Fellow. He's also at the International Institute for Strategic Studies at the U.S. Department of Defense. And as he will so indicate, uh, his remarks are, are his own and do not reflect those of his employer, uh, Colonel DeRoche. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. It is indeed an honor to be here. Uh, all of our speakers today are longstanding uh, associates, partners, uh, co-workers of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, which uh, is really an extraordinary organization in that it, it reflects the vision and drive of one man, and that's the man you just heard from. Uh, as he did note, I do not speak for the Department of Defense. I'm required to say that myself, even if somebody else previously says it for me. Uh, we have today a treat. Uh, we have uh, three practitioners uh, who have been intimately involved in the issues of the U.S. security presence in the Gulf. Uh, the pivot has been an active item of discussion really since the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review. Um, it's been much discussed. Uh, I personally have given, I, I came to count, over 15 lectures uh, at various fora on this topic, and sometimes to the same forum one year after another, and it just doesn't set in. My point is always that the pivot is away from Europe, not from the Gulf. Um, Europeans don't like to hear that, but, you know, they're Europeans. Um, anyhow, to our point today, we have some wonderful speakers. Uh, you can submit your questions in the YouTube, and I will put the questions to the speakers there. I'm sorry that we're not able to have full interaction, but in this age of Zoom bombing and uh, malign online activity. Lord only knows what you would see instead of these three experts here. Our first expert is uh, one of the um, one of the more forward leaning uh, Gulf intellectuals on defense issues. He was uh, an outstanding. I first met him when he was a student at Cutter's. Joanne Jim ba Joanne Bin Jasm, uh, Command and General Staff College, which 
had the highest academic standards of any um, Gulf-based military professional institution. He was uh, one of the, uh, he was the outstanding graduate of that institution uh, during that period. Uh, and uh, he then later served with distinction as Cutter's defense attache to the United States and Canada, have to point out in Canada as well, uh, which uh, in addition to providing smoke along the Eastern seaboard today also has long standing defense things. And he remains active uh, as a commentator, uh, as a uh, frequent visitor to American defense institutions, uh, and as a, a, a great insight on what is often opaque defense decision-making processes in the, in the Gulf. So it's with pleasure that I hand the microphone over to Sheikh uh, Nawaf uh, El Khani. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, uh, David, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anthony, uh, on this introduction and having me today. First of all, Eid Mubarak to everyone observing. And um, a congratulation to uh, you, uh, Dr. Anthony, and to the National Council on 40 amazing years. Looking forward to later this year celebrating formally this uh, great achievement. Uh, discussing uh, the, uh, the position of the United States in the Middle East from a Middle Eastern perspective, I think we should look at um, a few things prior to that. The perception of the U.S.'s presence in general, because you cannot decouple or unlink the U.S. presence um, uh, from the U.S. military presence. So my views here are my own, uh, my personal views. I do not represent or uh, by any means uh, these views reflect the, the views of the government of the state of Qatar or any of its agencies. Uh, but rather, um, my views is a my views are an amalgamation of observation of both public and government perception of what the U.S. Uh, is uh, currently and what it could be in the future when it comes to its presence. Now, looking at the perception, um, there are three main points, and I think there's a there's going to be a, a recurring theme of threes in what I'm going to be discussing today. First of all, a, a historical context. Uh, and the polarizing influence of the United States. Um, there has been for many years and decades a historical context within the Arab population um, of Western influence um, and intervention. It's not focused mainly on the U.S., but it's historical going back through back to colonial times. Um, and often that leads to negative sentiments among the populace. However, looking at the polarization side, views on U.S. military presence, for instance, are not uh, homogenous, varying greatly from um, among different Arab uh, nations and social groups. Uh, some view uh, military presence as a good thing and some not so good thing. So it, it is a bit polarization, uh, polarizing uh, um, in that sense. The second point in understanding uh, perception of U.S. presence is uh, regional stability. Uh, most governments in the Middle East and North Africa value US, uh, the U.S. Uh, providing security and deterring threats from non-state actors and regional uh, adversaries alike. That is something that is uh, continuous and I think carries big value in, in, in how the, the Middle East and North Africa perceives the U.S. presence in the Middle East. Finally, soft power and influence. So as we said, it goes beyond the military. Um, the U.S. is seen as a major influencer in political, economic, and social aspects, uh, which can be both uh, comforting and concerning, depending on one's perspective. And I think those two words, comforting or concerning, should take us to those two views of U.S. presence in the Middle East, focusing mainly now on the military. Uh, comforting factors, obviously, again, three. Uh, security assistance, uh, the U.S. provides something quite unique, which, which is a, a high-end military aid and support. And the, and the, the key words are here, you know, high-end. Many nations can provide capabilities, but as a, at a high-end, consistent, reliable level, I think the United States is quite unique in that, in that ability. Uh, Counterterrorism support, I think many nations uh, value uh, this, this support that the U.S. Uh, military uh, has provided, especially in nations grappling with uh, terrorism-related challenges. Uh, the third point here I would, uh, I would point out is uh, a balancing of power. Um, 
the, the U.S. Uh, providing a counterbalance to um, any current or even future regional powers, I think, um, is is a, is an added comfort for many nations in the region and is seen as such. But just like we see comforting factors, in my view, at least, there are concerning factors as well. Uh, the main one being sovereignty. Uh, there are concerns among some uh, that the perception of a new co colonialism of U.S. Uh, presence in the Middle East and North Africa is something that some are pointing to or are, you know have concerns about. Uh, certainly, um, uh, players from beyond the Middle East, uh, adversaries of the United States, have been pushing this narrative quite heavily, especially in recent times. Um, in second point, in recent military operations, we've seen um, many civilian casualties, many of them incidental because of military operation, but harm to civilians um, and unresolved resentment, unfortunately, amongst uh, some in the Middle East do also carry uh, concerns when considering U.S. presence and I believe should be dealt with um, in a, in a long-term uh, manner. Uh, the third concern, I think, is long-term intentions. Dr. Anthony, you pointed out the pivot to Asia. Questions remain about long-term intentions and commitment to the region. Uh, I think just the U.S. government and the military, um, in, you know, uh, in general, throwing out terminologies like pivot to Asia, great power competition. Um, uh, you know, these these are these are. These phrases that need to be explained more, need to be put into context where the U.S. is positioned today. And certainly, as we see, the U.S., from the defense perspective, is dealing with multi-theater, uh, uh, multi-domain dominance challenges, where it has to look at uh, conflicts in Europe, uh, challenges in the Indo-Pacific, and also reaffirming its presence in the CENCOM or the Middle East and North African region with, with, uh, with Africa com as well. And that is a challenge and has to be uh, enunciated and the, the, the views made clear to their partners in the Middle East. Otherwise, long-term intentions, there, there will be that ambiguity when it comes to deciphering um, uh, what the U.S. actually means. Um, and that is um, a concern, I believe. Now, addressing those concerns, I think, becomes then quite clear. Transparency, um, I think increased transparency will help build trust. And also making those future intentions clear builds trust in reliability and trust in belief in the long-term intentions that we mentioned earlier. Um, it's It's hard enough to to um, build critical thinking in the Arab world and the Arab street, let alone, you know, ask the, uh, the, um, the individual Arab uh, citizen in the street to be, a, you know, um, a mind reader as well is a bridge too far, I believe. It needs, intentions should be very clear. Um, capacity building, I think, right now is very uh, robust when it comes to capabilities. But I think building, um, helping in building um, governance, economic development uh, through military support, I think that is that is going to be the next step for uh, the U.S.'s presence, whether through the the spearhead of the military or through other cap you know uh, apparatus of the U.S. Uh, presence in the Middle East. Uh, regional partnerships, I think, is important, strengthening those partnerships and expand, expanding those partnerships to areas other than the defense um, um, uh, presence in the Middle East or the traditional defense presence in the Middle East, I think is important. Um, taking a page out of NATO, having centers of excellence, putting effort into education when it comes to defense uh, planning, um, uh, you know, uh, procurement uh, policy towards capability, those give a sense of sustainable presence, but also benefits both the indigenous capabilities of the host nations in the Middle East and North Africa, but also uh, gives uh, reassurance of the U.S.'s presence in the long term. 
Um, cultural sensitivities, I think, is quite important. Uh, U.S. policies, uh, uh, I think, should always be respectful uh, to social norms and religious beliefs in the region, um, and, and that is quite vital. We see uh, these uh, cultural questions now being uh, hashed out in the United States. The, the concern is that those questions now overflow into policies that that reflect into uh, presence beyond uh, the United States' border without putting into consideration those cultural sensitivities. And that is a, a very important tool for the U.S. to have a long-term trusted presence uh, in the Middle East, in my view. Finally, uh, conflict resolution. I think the U.S. should invest heavily in uh, the apparatus of conflict resolution. Uh, there are many nations that are uh, looking at at, uh, you know, stability through peace and not through war, as, you know, especially in these days as a, as a way forward. I think looking at the state of Qatar, where I am right now, uh, has, has proven itself quite uh, prominent in the area of conflict resolution through negotiation and through um, um, uh, coming up with, with um, a, um, amicable solutions to quite complex questions. And I think uh, the U.S. should invest in those areas. And I think with that, uh, you know, um, those main points uh, look at the Arab perspective for whether the U.S. is remaining or leaving, to put it, you know, oversimplistically. But uh, I think it's a complex question. I think it's a question that has to be put in uh, the grand scheme of the global U.S. military presence without losing sight of local issues and concerns of the Arab populace. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Sheikh. I appreciate it. That's a, that's a concise, succinct uh, statement of the issues at play. Um, the regional perspective is, of course, important, and the National Council is uh, a, a forum where we've heard the interaction between uh, regional and uh, American uh, analysts going back, you know, as I said, uh, almost almost 14 years now. Um, but that's about as succinct as a description as you'll get. Let's move now to uh, a person with a remarkable pedigree. Uh, she has, her resume rather, or her pedigree is impressive as well. Uh, uh, her father's one of the greatest men I've ever met. Um, she has worked at the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations and at my institution, the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, she's also um, small, further on down, which she does, was the director for Gulf Affairs of the National Security Council in the White House, among many, many other postings. Uh, she currently works for a commercial firm, uh, Red Six, which is one of the uh, global industry leaders in drone counter drone technology and uh, is just a force of nature. Uh, I'm honored to call her a friend and uh, always learn something for her. Ms. Fonten Rose, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Dave. Great to see you. Great to be here with the council. One of my early homes, um, and Eid Mubarak to everyone who's watching. I'm going to present a contrarian view here, half because this kind of thing amuses Dave, and also for the purposes of provoking thought and debate. So let me lay out this view, and then we'll walk through it. I believe that the U.S. is not pivoting away from the U.S. or from the Middle East, but that the Middle East is pushing the U.S. out. Now let me build the case. We'll walk through this together. America's interests in the Middle East have remained fairly constant over the past two decades, if not longer. And it's just that with the Eastern administration, the prioritization of those interests changes and occasionally one is added. But they've been outlined in fairly consistent language in the national security strategies throughout these years. And these interests broadly are, just as a reminder, open and sustained markets for U.S. businesses, secure international shipping lanes, consolidate counterterrorism gains, say that 10 times fast, contain and deter Iran and compete with and counter Russia and China, which is one of the more uh, the, one of the newer acts. So back in the George W. Bush administration, there was a focus on nation building and democratization of the region. Barack Obama's administration focused on a nuclear deal with Iran, on ramping up the counterterrorism fight and on pursuing disengagement from the region. And then Trump focused on forcing a guns or butter choice in Iran 
uh, to limit its nuclear and proxy programs, on increasing burden sharing by partners in the region, and on building a regional security architecture. And the Biden doctrine has five principles that they've laid out. The first is partnerships. The second is deterrence. The third is diplomacy. The fourth is integration. And the fifth is values. So the U.S. has experienced both success and shortfalls in each of these throughout the years. And the relationships with regional partners have had ups and downs we all know about. When thinking analytically about the Middle East and trying to analyze what's happening now, what jumps out first and foremost is the massive zeitgeist shift it has undergone in recent years. And this poses a challenge of adaptation for some American and I would also say European leaders who really understand the Middle East in the context of the oil for security agreement established by the Carter Doctrine and the context of the Gulf Wars and their aftermath, when the Arab world needed us more than we needed them, and we were the unchallenged victors of the Cold War, we were sending our military to protect what we saw as wealthy but helpless and very reasonable Arab monarchs in the Persian Gulf, who kept cheap oil flowing to our military machine and our economies. Well, these monarchs and their troublesome but predictable autocratic neighbors on the east and south of the Med have now been replaced by a new generation of leadership we all love to watch every day. They're young, they're vision focused, they're autocratic, they're consolidating power in a more narrow family branches or political in groups. And so traditional relationships are being tested and new ones are being formed. And all this has created some cognitive dissonance between the Middle East priorities and America's. And I think that's presenting the big challenge in relations now that's making people wonder whether a pivot is happening. Arab leaders are prioritizing domestic economic development and growth. But the conversations they invite the U.S. into are still security centric. They talk to China about economic development. They talk to the U.S. about bilateral defense agreements and about arms sales. And on the U.S. side, the U.S. wants to reduce its footprint in the region, but it wants to remain the preferred partner of the region. So this is tough. You know, this both both sides of this are coming at it with some slightly skewed um, expectations. And this misalignment of priorities impacts policy decisions here in D.C. and get, raises questions like this pivot. As I mentioned, America has multiple buckets of interests and priorities that are shuffled in each administration. The U.S. currently claims to prioritize human and civil rights when making foreign policy decisions, while many governments in the Middle East and China prioritize economic growth and expansion of their international influence. And sometimes these two things are mutually exclusive. As a result, devising strategy is tough in the circles here in Washington. For the first half of this administration, the U.S. strategy toward the Middle East was frankly not to have one. But two years in, we got a national security strategy, and the title of the portion about the Middle East is Support De-Escalation and Integration. In other words, the administration conceived of the Middle East through a damage control lens, and they focused on keeping protracted conflicts at arm's length, like in Syria and in Libya, and on pursuing campaign promises they made on Iran and Yemen, and on either scolding the new generation of re leadership in the region, like in Saudi, the UAE, and in Egypt, or assuming status quo relations with other young leaders instead of building new forward-looking relationships like in Oman or Kuwait. So the region was looking for a build together strategy from the US, but they got an exasperated damage control strategy instead. The good news is now that we're this far into the administration, there is distinct proof of commitment to the region in support of both the de-escalation and integration uh, priorities in two lanes. One is military, it's CENTCOM's regional construct project, and one is diplomatic, it's the State Department-led Negev Forum. And these are just, I'm just using these as big examples. Um, these are limited to the Gulf and Israel, but I think they stand as really good, solid indications of U.S. commitment for long-term engagement, i.e. not a pivot. CENTCOM has three strategic priorities, and I'm sure a boss can go into this further if we'd like him to. And the input of partner countries was taken into consideration in the region when they define these, deterring Iran as the first, countering violent extremist groups, and then strategic competition versus Russia and uh, China are the second and third. CENTCOM also has two functional priorities. The first is the regional construct, which is like a Mesa light, which we can go into if you'd like. Mesa was the Trump administration's regional construct project. And then the second is working with partners to counter drones and missiles. So the focus of the regional construct is pragmatic in that it aligns CENTCOM's three strategic priorities. And an important fact to note about the regional construct is that it seeks to build a block of nations in the region with the U.S. at the table. It would lock the U.S. into extended engagement, but it is moving slowly and with a lot of pushback from the region because they do not trust one another. We've seen similar pushbacks from parts of the region to the other tangible proof of U.S. commitment, 
which is the NEGA Forum. This is a robust project led by the U.S. to plan and implement multilateral projects among the nations in the region with relations with Israel to leapfrog technical and economic collaboration in areas that bring benefit to the populations of the country that those populations can see. So even some of the countries with longstanding relations with Israel are giving the U.S. the cold shoulder on this project, which, again, would lock the U.S. into long-term commitment. This is notable and concerning. America's efforts to embed itself into the region on topics that are tied directly to regional security and prosperity are being pushed off by the region. The cognitive dissonance I've mentioned before between U.S. and regional priorities is not only at that strategic level. It also bears out very concretely when these priorities are implemented. The new, young forward-looking zeitgeist in the region we talked about, wants to implement plans that, frankly, make the U.S. government kind of squeamish. And this explains the hesitancy by policymakers to respond positively to requests for support of these plans, and it explains a lot of the congressional pushback. In a nutshell, many of the large initiatives being pursued by the region, especially in the Gulf, where there are resources to pursue more than just minimal service provision, are initiatives that make the U.S. a little bit nervous. And these are things like space programs, because they could be militarized, nuclear programs because they could be militarized, the buildup of indigenous defense industrial sectors because competition could be uh, presented then for U.S. industrial sectors, and because it reduces the U.S. visibility on what each nation is developing with whom. So look at the host of new UAE edge joint ventures with China as an example. Plus, it could lead to less interoperability with U.S. and NATO systems, which also makes the U.S. a little squeamish. And then things like surveillance technology. There's an ongoing demand for this across the region, despite embarrassing stories about the NSO group and others like that. Governments still seek the capabilities, just under different names, as do governments around the world. This is not unique to the Middle East. But the U.S. does not want these capabilities to be acquired because of the potential for abuse of them in states that don't have legislative or judicial powers that balance executive decision making. One factor that the region, I think, must consider when assessing the U.S. approach to security partnerships um, is the crippling effect of their strengthening relationships with China and in some cases, Russia. Most countries in the Middle East tell us that these relationships are for them purely pragmatic. This could be completely true. But what is also true is that China and Russia regularly conduct operations to steal U.S. military technology. Simple fact, real politic. This kind of mutual espionage is the large piece of the, of the gray zone where we talk about that's going on between the U.S. and China and Russia. And this means the U.S. can't risk placing new or sensitive technologies in countries or on networks where China and Russia are also present or in military offices and on government systems. This is not a fault of the Middle East, but it is a fact. And it must be factored into pragmatic approaches to the U.S. Middle East security partnerships and other partnerships. It's also a fact the countries in the region are creating joint ventures with China that I referenced to develop sensitive military equipment. And it is a fact that China is very clearly listed in America's national security strategy available unclassified online to anyone as the U.S.'s top security threat. So countries in the region are choosing to become best friends with America's biggest adversary. And I want to make one important note on this. This fact will not change regardless of who is elected president in the U.S. in 2024. Preventing China and Russia from overtaking the U.S. on the world stage is the number one priority in the new United States national security strategy released by the Biden administration, as well as in the top priorities of the last several administrations. And it remains a bipartisan issue of support in Congress. So if Middle Eastern countries make sovereign decisions based on pragmatism to continue to grow closer to China or to Russia, to these two U.S. competitors of sorts, they are forcing a U.S. decision to limit the transfer of technologies, to limit the transfer of intelligence sharing based on um, equally pragmatic concerns that the U.S. has. Combining this fact of real politic with the regional state's slow rolling of America's offer to build a lasting regional construct and regional state's pursuit of nuclear programs and sensitive missile and drone programs with China, it becomes very clear that the U.S. is not pivoting away from the region. The region is pushing the U.S. out. But I'll say this in conclusion. It's a perfect time to review and re-energize these partnerships. The death of the Carter Doctrine doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing because it creates an urgency to redefine the foundations of the relationship. And frankly, it's about time. The landscape has drastically changed as we've already walked through. Energy for security isn't good enough anymore. 
Parameters of security have changed. Future of energy has changed. Mutual interests have not shrunk. They have expanded. Things like cyber, quantum, hypersonics are challenges in the security realm both the U.S. and the Middle East face, and they aren't even geo-limited to the region. In the region, goals like developing green energy, food security, counterterrorism and, um, and uh, countering violent extremism management, climate change, creating conditions that make mass migration unnecessary, expanding access to electricity and education in the region, military interoperability, making just deserts plantable, building satellite elevators, blah, blah, blah. And that's just in the region. These are things that could be done together. So, so much more globally could be done via development aid and targeted investment that is synchronized. So bottom line, both the U.S. and the region can achieve more of their goals in partnership, but not if America's efforts to stay in the region are being rejected by the region itself. Thank you. Wow. Well, I've got to tell you, Kristen, that was fantastic. Um, I, I, too, am a contrarian on this, and I share your, as a matter of fact, I've said in numerous forms and have written that the real challenge is not a clash of civilizations, like Samuel Huntington said, or a clash between um, democracy and other forms of government. It's between the Western version of participative democracy and an emerging vision of a techno-authoritarian state. Uh, and then I also have to uh, commend you, uh, not just for using zeitgeist properly, which uh, is is rare, but but happens from time to time, but for the most appropriate use. And I believe the first I've heard in a form such as of the sad trombone noise, which always adds uh, uh, something to, to a form. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on now to one of the more distinguished soldiers of my uh, generation, a man who has served with distinction in three armies, um, I'm a graduate of West Point, but I got to tell you, uh, uh, if you were to walk around West Point, it would be as if I was never there. I made about as much influence as a canoe does pedaling across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Abbas de Hook was a professor of Arabic and also decided to establish uh, and, and succeeded in establishing the Department of Persian, which was not present when I was there, which I did not see there. Um, he uh, has a distinguished record of military service, not just at West Point, but in combat. Uh, has served uh, in uh, uh, one other army, uh, is a graduate of one of the Russian military schools in Simferopol, uh, in Crimea during the Soviet Union. And I thought I was kind of hot stuff, you know, because he's a master parachutist, I'm a master parachutist. I'm one of the few Americans who've fired an RPG-7 in combat. And just casually, he uh, gave me uh, a, an insight on the uh, hyper stability of the RPG-7 round and how to aim it when you have a crosswind, which uh, <laughs> I should have known, but I didn't. And it, obviously a man who knows what he's doing it. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to the George Clooney of Contemporary Middle wow. East Studies, Colonel Abbas de Hook. Well, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, remind me to uh, take care of that after the discussion here. But uh, uh, good morning to uh, my distinguished uh, uh, friends here. And I'm also honored to be here. And uh, good morning to our listeners uh, near and far. And yes, uh, Eid Mubarak to all our uh, practicing uh, our, uh, uh, Muslims. Um, you know, the pivot, I mean, this is, I think, we, is it pivot? Is it rebalance? I think maybe a combination of both. I would uh, rather say is uh, it's a more of a rebalance of U.S. posture in the, in the, in the, re, in the globe, uh, writ large versus just to concentrate on the rebalance, re-posture in the Middle East. Uh, somebody said that when you, in the military, when you pivot, you basically change direction, but your heel remains uh, dug in in one spot. So I think uh, even though if the United States is pivoting to uh, to uh, to uh, to Asia, that that heel still in the Middle East. So they're not moving their heels. They're still dug in, and while in the Middle East, they're still going to prosecute whatever they're going to do in, in in China. And uh, at the end of the day, or the or the Indo Pacific, at the end of the day, its uh, strategy is all about uh, how to balance between countering threat and securing your economic opportunities. And that's uh, so it's all it's all a balance. Um, I want to talk about uh, quickly, I mean, hodgepodge of things. So one a bit about uh, how I see uh, why U.S. decided to uh, kind of pivot to China and where do we, uh, where is the, where does the United States and the Middle Eastern countries agree or disagree on a threat, you know, at least in the last uh, uh, 20 years. And just mention some of the common uh, security uh, threats today, but uh, remains uh, between the U.S. And the, and the Middle East. 
So in, in, uh, in general, I mean, we all agree that the strategy in the Indo-Pacific, perhaps the number one priority is avoiding a war with, uh, with China. That's the big thing. We're not going to war versus in the Middle East. We, have, we went to war, right? We had to re regime change. We went to Iraq and Afghanistan. And China is not about war. It's about how to uh, avoid war uh, with China. In the Middle East, it's going to remain the, sa the same thing. And the focus on the U.S. It will be in, um, uh, the security of Israel. Is it the, uh, it's also securing the uh, resources, oil resources in the region, and maintaining the uh, freedom of navigation uh, around the Arabian Peninsula and the Mediterranean Sea. So, regardless whether it's pivot or no pivot, all this uh, has is 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 constant. It's going to be the same. Now, on the uh, just an observation on why U.S. decided or Obama administration decided to uh, it wasn't his idea, right? But just like Kristen talked about the changes in the administration, I mean, U uh, U.S. decided to show China or, uh, uh, that uh, uh, they can operate independently, just like they operate independently in the Middle East, and they can ensure those flow of communication, a flow of navigation around the uh, Arabian Peninsula. They, the United States wants to show. The, that that the allies and friends in that region, then they could do the same thing around those uh, bodies of water, especially uh, 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 the China Sea. They could do the same there, and especially in the international waters. There are international waters that the United States thinks they can, uh, they should be have should have access to it. Um, uh, so that hints the 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 clash with, with that. The problem in the in the Indo Pacific is the the defense posture and the and defense in the Middle East. We we have a strong enduring defense posture. We have boots on the grounds almost everywhere, from Qatar to uh, Kuwait to uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, everywhere. Did not have the same presence in uh, in the Indo-Pacific. We have U.S. has a strong presence in South Korea. They have a very large footprint. They have uh, a joint command, three-star command in Japan, uh, South Korea. Uh, and in Japan, they have a presence, but they didn't have the joint operation with the Japanese military. There's a small footprint in Australia, but it's nothing, nothing the same like uh, in the Middle East. So that's a problem. So that's why I look at it as a rebalance. They are not rebalance in the, from the Middle East is rebalance their the defense posture in the Indo-Pacific. They have to rebalance that to be able to replicate what, what, uh, what, uh, what has been done in the Middle East. And another factor on the, uh, on the rebalancing or pivoting is the uh, um, the um, uh, disengagement I mean, Obama administration and Trump administration and also Biden administration. They want to disengage from the operations in the Middle East, and we we, we know that uh, that's a big deal. That so that's on the on the pivot letterage. on the on the threat. Just a little historical uh, thing, just to put things in perspective on where the U.S. Uh, and the Middle East dis, uh, disagreed on definition of threat. On the after September 11th, we know that President uh, uh, Bush decided he uh, it was uh, was pretty cut and dry. Either with, with the United States or with the terrorists, there was that cut and dry. And it was also um, uh, 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 also had the uh, uh, then followed by the uh, invasion of Iraq. So obviously at that time there was a there wasn't a uh, there was a disag uh, disagreement obviously on the definition of threat. And, and none of the Arab countries uh, 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 helped the United States in, uh, in prosecuting its operations uh, in Iraq. Meantime, at the same time in 2003, Saudi Arabia faced the, own, the, the, own, the same threat. It was also uh, the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But the Saudis uh, smart, uh, they looked at it in a different way, did not call them terrorists. They call them al fi al dhalla means the, devi the deviant youth. And that's what uh, uh, it, 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 it prosecuted differently. They were very successful to counter not only the uh, the threat, the terrorist uh, 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 operations in in in, uh, in, their, in Saudi Arabia. Also, they were able to counter the ideology of that uh, terrorist, where the United States were not able to do that. They were uh, they've done a lot of counter uh, chase Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda leadership, but could not could not stop that, that uh, ideology. So there was a disconnect in there how to prosecute uh, the, uh, the threat to the terrorism. Fast forward in 2014, when uh, um, ISIS came into the picture, there was an agreement. Everybody was in agreement. Everybody agreed that ISIS is a threat. ISIS is a terrorist. And, uh, and uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, at that time could not do what President Bush did. You say, you're with me on the terrorist. We are, we are on a crusade. We're going to do it. Could not do that. Uh, they needed the, uh, the the participation of the uh, Arab countries, and there was a meeting back in uh, uh, I think it was September 2014 in, in Jeddah, 
and that was uh, on how to uh, integrate uh, Arab countries into the counter ISIS. And I, uh, I strongly believe without the uh, integration of uh, Gulf states, or, you know, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, into the counter ISIS, uh, I think counter ISIS coalition would not have been that successful. Would have been another somewhat crusade and another uh, Al Qaeda fight. So that was uh, a pretty. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, agreement on the on the uh, on the terrorism, and they, we know what happened in counter ISIS. We're still fighting the uh, terrorism, but at least is everybody in agreement? And the problem remains on the counter ideology part of it. Still not as successful. Fast forward to, to, to 2015. Sorry about that. When uh, when Yemen when the Houthi, uh, Houthis uh, took on uh, Sana'a and became uh, well, the first time ever a non-state actor takes on an Arab capital, and that added another capital to the Iranian hegemony, you know, added to Lebanon, uh, you know Beirut, uh, Damascus, and Baghdad, and now Yemen under Iranian control. Uh, the U.S. government disagreed with the with the Arab uh, countries. They said, "No, this is uh, not a uh, a threat to the region. This is uh, not a regional threat, but this is a a uh, civil war in Yemen." And uh, an Obama administration decided not to interfere. And that was actually a pivot point where where the Arab countries decide to break away from the United States. I think this is the point where they found, they saw that. Okay, United States, you're not going to commit hundred percent, well, at least a big uh, to, to our security. We can we can do it alone. And, and they did. And they formed that coalition, the Arab uh, coalition. It was the first coalition, first co uh, fighting coalition outside Western powers. The first one ever. There's none like it. Always any coalition, fighting coalition in the world, you'll see some element, Western element into it. They did that in the, by themselves. They, they did and prosecuted. Not only they did, they started the war themselves without any inter uh, support from the U.S., there also there was a U political support. There was a U.S. resolution 2254, basically uh, describing that that this operation legitimate. The you know, Houthis must be, must stop. Houthis must go, leave uh, Sanaa. Houthi must uh, disarm and so on. So that was that was big point. Uh, there also was a disagreement uh, on on that. The fourth, uh, I mean, those, the fourth one the disagreement I want to talk about is how to counter Iranian nuclear uh, program. Uh, in this case, both the United States and the Arab countries agree on that. They all agree, including Israel this time. This is unprecedented where Israel now became part of the picture of undefining a threat. And where everybody agreed that Iran will not and should not be a nuclear capable country. However, the disagreement was on how to get there. Obama administration decided to do it alone, decided to do the JCPA by itself without even uh, consulting regional countries, not even consulting Israel. Uh, and so, and we know what happened with the GC, JCPOA, and the result of that is Saudi Arabia find an alternate way to do it by uh, talking to China, and hence the U.S.-China-Iran agreement uh, that uh, that was uh, one of the consequences uh, of that. So this is a little uh, to to see the, the, what, how we, uh, the dynamics of pivot, dynamics uh, of the threat. The last thing I want to mention is uh, so currently right now, even though the there is a rebalance, there's a pivot, a pivot, there's a disagreement on a definition of threat. Because again, strategy, you need to have a strategy, you have to define the threat. And we can't have United States and Gulf countries uh, conduct uh, uh, strategy together or uh, exercises without defining what are you doing together, what is the threat, or what are the common opportunities. But there's common security threat between the United States and the Middle East remains the same. Obviously, what right now is you have the uh, air missile defense. You got to have uh, that's important for the United States uh, also because we, it's, the United States is still present in there. Not only presence in, in the terms of defense, uh, defense posture and equipment. You have thousands of uh, U.S. citizens still actually living and working in the Middle East, and also uh, you know that's a threat to them. The cybersecurity is also a threat for both. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, maritime security is also a common threat. They need to work together on it. Uh, and then, obviously, Iran, Iran Iranians, the proliferation of the uh, of the UAVs across uh, across the region and providing such uh, capability to Hezbollah, to uh, Hamas, and others. So that's also a a, a, a common security concern. Last thing I want to talk about on the. On the uh, operational side in the Middle East, there's two big things happening in the uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the region still very robust. Is the coalition maritime forces out of Bahrain? 
I mean, this is the still, even though we're talking about fifth heading to Indo-Pacific, where Indo-Pacific became the number one priority for uh, as a geographic command, not CENTCOM, because all through the last two decades, CENTCOM was priority one. Now CENTCOM is priority two after Indo-Pacific. But yet we still have this coalition, uh, see, uh, coalition maritime forces. It has the, the largest coalition maritime coalition in the world, literally. And it's still in there. 34 countries operating. The All the surrounding countries are, are, are part of this coalition. They have multiple task forces of counterterrorism, counter piracy, uh, all the way to now you have uh, recently introduced new task forces, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, UAVs and, and manned vessels. Uh, now they, they're trying to do what's called the ocean, digital ocean. They're trying to enhance this, uh, uh, the, the, observe, the, the, uh, uh, the the operating picture, all that, which is pretty good. But the, but but what happened is still lacking the political will to uh, to act on whatever they find. I mean, it's nice you 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 use that as a term you're, you're finding a lot of things, but still, in the, uh, and that's a criticism from you know, from the Gulf countries to the United States. I understand you have this capability, but you're always finding illegal activities on the high seas. But we're not doing much about it. And I'll be confiscating some here uh, drugs, confiscating some uh, weapons going from Iran to Houthis or to Hezbollah, but uh, Iran continued to do that. So this 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 presence remains the same, but lack lacks lack a political will to act on it. The other big thing happened recently, also to prove that the the pivot is uh, is, uh it's not that I mean uh, that the U.S. Presence in the Middle East is important. Is that recent exercise that happened between the United States? I think uh, beginning this year, last year, uh, the uh, Juniper Oak. This is the largest military exercise ever that happens between the United States and Israel. That's it. I mean, two countries came together and did that exercise. You have 6,400 Americans and well, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and sailors that participated in it, about 1,600 Israeli forces, uh, over 250 aircrafts. I mean, this is a gigantic exercise. Uh, that, that also another proof that that, that region is still very important in the United States. Uh, and it's uh, perhaps there is uh, some rebalancing of posture to counter China, but you, uh, the the uh, the uh, the anchor will remain in the uh, in, in the Middle East uh, uh, for a for a long time to come. I'll end it here. Well, thank, oh, you. thank you. That's a lot of food for thought. Um, so now we move to the question portions, and again. Uh, if you submit your questions uh, to the YouTube, uh, we will amalgamate them. And uh, I'm sorry, we can't go directly out, but we get people putting, um, you know, videos on and screening obscenities or whatever. So uh, uh, it's my job to screen obscenities, not uh, the random public. So our first question, which I'm going to throw out to the, the group, and I think we'll do this in random, is about defense diversity, diversification of defense resources. Uh, all three of the speakers have spoken on this to some extent. But uh, oddly enough, what we didn't mention was what happened in Russia over the weekend. And normally the um, go to uh, dif diversifier from Western arms sources for uh, the Gulf of the Middle East is Russia is the first choice. China is the second choice, both because of inferior quality of defense products, uh, as well as just the fact that they don't have the long track record of uh, uh, military sales. They have commercial sales, but not that, with one or two exceptions like surface-to-surface uh, -surface ballistic missiles between China and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So um, can we talk a bit about diversification? First off, in terms of outside suppliers, Russia, China, has the events in Russia um, affected Russia's reputation as a uh, <laughs> reliable supplier of, of weapons or as a supplier of first-rate weapons, and that could be the coup or the war. And then um, the possibilities for domestic replacement of imported weapons. And we'll do it in order. So let's start first with you, Sheikh Nawaf. Okay, first of all, I you know, there were a lot of uh, military academy names being thrown about, so I just want to set the record straight here. Uh, everyone knows the uh, the, uh, the the best you know, uh, military academy is my alma mater, Ahmed bin Mohammed Military Academy, where being a parachutist is a prerequisite to graduation. So, chew on that, Colonel. Um, going back to your uh, going back to your question, I think uh, diversification is happening definitely. Uh, just as an example, in Qatar, 
uh, we are we've been diversifying our weapons uh, throughout NATO countries. Now you may say, well, it's all Western. Well, I mean, it is divers- diversifying away from U.S. Uh, equipment. So we see French airplanes, uh, uh, UK, uh, uh, European airplanes, um, ships from uh, NATO members um, from Italy, Turkey, uh, and that is that is to build a capability that is. NATO compliant, that it is easier to operate. Now, I can't speak for other nations that, that go beyond NATO, obviously, but at least from my observation on Qatar with the, with the modernization of, of um, uh, our military in the past uh, five years, we've seen uh, a diversification of the source from multiple NATO members. And I think uh, that shows that uh, no one country is wedded to um, a product from a nation, but to a capability. So whatever capability is provided, I think, uh, as long as it works within uh, a system and a doctrine in a, in a in a effective way, that will be the way that nation will go. And I give an example about Qatar, obviously, but other nations uh, will choose to go to wherever that serves their own doctrine. Okay. Ms. Fontenrose. Hi there. Um, I think one of the things the U.S. is doing that's going to be helpful in um, in helping the Middle East maintain its relationship with the U.S. defense supply chain is new Tiger legislation. If you're tracking this, um, Representative Mike Waltz and a couple of other folks in a bipartisan bill draft put out. Tiger is an acronym. I can't remember exactly what it sounds for. You know, a lot of these acronyms are adorably clever. Um, yeah. But it says that it calls on the U.S. interagency, so State Department, um, Defense Department and others to improve and speed up the foreign military sales process because what we hear consistently from the region is we want to buy american but we can't buy american we have to go with russian we have to go with chinese we have to go with south korean we have to go with french because you all don't let us buy it um that has definitely been true but we've also seen for instance even the biden administration has approved pretty much every sale the saudis have been waiting for except for PGMs except for precision guidance guided missiles. Um, but everything else has been has been pretty much pushed through. And hopefully this legislation will get some of the interagency moving. We had, I think, a setback a little bit earlier this year when the State Department issued a new combat arms transfer policy or conventional arms transfer policy. Sorry. And it made the FMS process even tougher. We call it the CAP process. And it it and it instilled even new hoops to jump through, many more human rights reviews, for instance. And um, it was sort of completely against what a letter from six or seven U.S. career ambassadors had said to the State Department earlier in the administration, which was, if we don't fix our foreign military sales process, we will lose out here to China and Russia, who do not tie to their foreign military sales the things that we tie in terms of human rights reviews, in terms of packages, in terms of end user requirements. Um, and because we can't get them things when they are facing imminent threats from Iran, from proxies in Iraq and Yemen, then we're, they don't, we are not giving them a choice. We need to be giving them a choice. So in my opinion, State Department, um, their, the new transfer policy, goes against what State Department ambassadors operating in the region were saying. And um, we saw pushback from uh, DSCA within DOD. We saw pushback from the Office of Secretary of Defense. They arrived at a compromise over several months, but it still makes that review harder. So now this Tiger legislation says, "Uh uh-uh, fix it. This takes way too long. There's one thing, though. This is something we should be encouraged by. But the one issue is that a lot of the problems with foreign military sales happen in Congress. So... They have roughly 30 days to review a foreign military sale once the Political Military Affairs Bureau at the State Department puts it on their desks. But that's not in writing. So if if a congressional member wishes to slow roll a sale because they just don't like a country for any matter of reasons, they can sit on that for months and months and months. There's, There's no legislation that says if they do not respond within 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever, then the deal is considered approved. So it's a way for Congress then to drag out that process, even if you had state and DOD just churning these around quickly. So we'd still need to address that. Um, But anyway, I'm just speaking to the American piece there. We can go into others if you'd like, but I'll leave that uh, for Abbas to talk about. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh, no. no. 
That's a good point. Um, this is a long standing. I mean, I, I think the issue is not so much the law, which does have a formal end date, but it's the what's scabbed up over the years. And it originally started, I, I saw the memo once, it was the letter uh, to Hubert Humphrey as leader of the Senate that said, there will be uh, informal review uh, before the administration goes forward and formally notifies uh, Congress of this. And what's happened is that informal review has become infinite open-ended and allows any member of Congress to jam up anything. But I, I think this, the summation of your marks is really the role of the legislature. And I think we have to, we have to take into account that the president is, uh, the, this administration is trying to balance, um, it's legislature, which has, you know, some very active members, you know, Chris Murphy of Connecticut, uh, who, quite frankly, want to see uh, all weapons sales be based on uh, what career diplomats and career security persons would consider to be uh, political factors rather than that. So it's 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 tough. It's tough. And uh, Mike Waltz uh, uh, was on the other side of a partition of the Pentagon for me for a long time. And uh, we often uh, <laughs> declaim this, but I don't think he'll have any success uh, quite frankly, because what he's basically asking the legislature to do is to restrict its ability to uh, interfere. But we'll see, inshallah. Um, Colonel DeHook, you, you've wrestled with these issues in real life yeah. and in many countries. Yeah, I've done that, uh, you know, this uh, security cooperation for uh, for years in many different places. And uh, e even at the State Department, which is not very few people you see at defense actually working at the state. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, in the military industry, the problem is uh, military industry is all about sales. And you can expedite that through Congress, state, DOD, and deliver products and uh, articles uh, and services. But that's still, that's not, that, that's halfway there. You still have to train, not only train them in the United States, you still have to do like joint training to have an interoperability between uh, troops and to get proficient on this equipment. You have to uh, train jointly. And that's not happening at all in the Middle East. I mean, the re and for the last last uh, two years, the United States has been uh, involved in combat. Most of the boots on the grounds, the people that actually has to do the training, the military, the army, the Marines, they're not available. They're fighting wars in Afghanistan and fighting wars in Iraq. So there was an influx. You're buying, you're buying equipment, but you're not integrating this equipment in, in a, in a, in a right, right way. So that's the shortcoming from the United States. Even though the, there might be a will on behalf of the uh, friends they were there. There is a will to do that, but it's not happening. So again, it has to, it's a, it's a full cycle. We, have, we talk, we US talk about full cycle, but the, the full cycle is not, is not within, uh, just from, uh, uh, on the, on the, on the partner side. We have to have a full cycle on our side and nobody is addressing that full cycle on the, on the US side. And on the diversification of the thing, that's, uh, I mean, it worked well for uh, Qatar. It has a multiple different uh, conditions than the civil Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi so Arabia went to Yemen. The diversification was a problem, right? Because you have, you, you, you deployed a war with uh, assets from China, from United States, from South Korea, from Italy, from, uh, from United Kingdom. It's very hard on the battlefield. Logistics is very, very, very different. And I think what's happening here, it's uh, uh, a diversification is still fine, but what the countries are looking for, not just uh, uh, buying it, right, or, or co-develop it, they want to do it jointly in country. So when things happen in the future, they don't re rely on supplies coming from the United States, they want to be able to produce it in country. And if I can't produce something in country, I'm not going to buy it from you. I'll, have, I'll buy it from China, or I can produce it in country, I'll buy it from Russia. So it's not just diversification, uh, it's also ability to uh, localize this for many reasons. One is to create jobs, for it, right? And then it's also to maintain that you are, you are, you are in charge of your own uh, logistics uh, then. So. Well, thanks. And, you know, while, while Sheikh Nawaf and while Christian was talking, you, you highlighted another point, which is sometimes the United States is just out, of, to use Donald Rumsfeld's phrase, sometimes we're just out of Schlitz. So, you know, we didn't have the soldiers uh, available to do the joint training during the, the years of the global war on terror. One of the problems, I think, with the U.S. supplying stuff is, uh, given the Ukraine war, you know, a lot of this stuff is very scarce. I mean, the uh, uh, Raytheon's production of Patriot Pac-2 missiles is less, you know, peacetime production was less than 300 a year. 
And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia needs to recapitalize its, um, uh, you know, they fired quite a few. They fired several years production. And now we have Ukraine needing these. Uh, just yesterday, uh, it was announced that uh, there's going to be a $15 billion buy of Polish buy of Patriot, now Pac-3, but still, you know, that's $15 billion stuff. And right now, I, I would argue that uh, frontline Ukraine countries are probably higher up the queue than uh, our traditional security parts in the Middle East. So so there's there's political, there's the role of the legislature, there's the role of domestic industries, which I think Colonel DeHook and Sheikh Nawaf, you, you really did. And then there's also just the fact that we may not have the stuff to sell in a timely manner, yeah. which is a further complicating factor. Our next question, and I'm sorry for interjecting so much myself in this, but this is such a, a fascinating, infinitely fascinating issue. I, I have no discipline when it comes to that. Uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, you know, something nobody's proud of, um, but uh, the way it worked out. But uh, since we have, a, a, you know, a, a former Qatari government official, and of course, Qatar uh, negotiated or, or rather hosted uh, the negotiations and facilitated the negotiations uh, between the United States and the Taliban, which led to this, uh, and then received a large number of the refugees uh, after the implosion of the state. Uh, you know, how has that affected uh, the American role in the region? You know, are we perceived as an unreliable, inconstant thing? So we'll start with Sheikh Nawaf, and then I'll ask uh, either of the other uh, two distinguished guests if they have views on that. Yes, Dave, thank you. I think this is a, an important question. Um, obviously, the state of Qatar did a couple of things when it came to the U.S. withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, the first part is the diplomatic uh, uh, avenue. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I think, did a superb job in their continuing tradition of negotiation and, uh, and finding solutions in very creative ways through diplomacy to uh, make sure that the, um, the, the road was clear for any operational support uh, that we may be needed for uh, what happened to be in the end, the U.S. withdrawal of Afghanistan. And I think hosting the negotiation, hosting the talks uh, quite successfully, as I hear from my uh, foreign ministry friends, it was quite difficult, but I mean, kudos to them for what they did uh, quite brilliantly. The other side of that coin was the defense uh, effort. The Ministry of Defense did not only host um, um, the U.S. and tens of thousands of Afghan uh, refugees and uh, evacuees from different nationalities in Qatar through our air bases, but Qatar also participated in the actively, operationally, uh, through our uh, strategic airlift uh, capability, through the MOD, in one of the world's uh, largest airlift in history, um, uh, something that is 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 for me as a as a former member uh, of of the service, you know, it's a, it's a you know it's a point of pride for me to see my fellow uh, members of the MOD do that in in, in such style and fashion, but also. Um, you know, securing the airports on the ground in Kabul, in, in Afghanistan, to make sure that end-to-end uh, -end, uh, secure uh, lift uh, was done uh, supporting the U.S. Air Force. So uh, those two sides from a small state like Qatar so shows um, a degree of robustness, I think, um, um, for small states to have that agility and that capability, that niche, defense capability and that diplomatic agility to achieve uh, the, those goals that you mentioned in that question and become a more um, uh, added value partner to the United States when it comes to those um, niche capabilities and, and, and deploying them in such an effective manner. Uh, Ms. Fontenrose or Colonel DeHook? No? Abbas? Uh, well, okay, quickly on the, yes, on the... Uh, on the disengagement in Afghanistan, um, regardless of what happened in there, they can uh, compare that to the engagement of Russia and Syria. So, okay, look what happened. What happened in Afghanistan? You, your policy changed, or have a new administration decided to uh, uh, leave for whatever reason? Uh, but, but, uh, but uh, Russia uh, stayed, and even now, look at the war on Ukraine. 
and uh, Russia in a bind everywhere you look at it, you know, military, diplomatically, economically. Yet recently, two days ago, Russia conducted a joint military operation with the Syrian regime. I mean, think about the commitment the Russians are, have with the, with the Assad regime uh, versus the commitment that uh, we saw from the uh, from United States that where we, we lost uh, blood and treasure in Afghanistan and decided just to uh, bail out. Uh, so uh, there is also a big uh, uh, a, a failure, a catastrophic failure on the diplomatic side, on the military side, and how we prosecuted that uh, uh, disengagement from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, Ms. Fontenrose and I were at a... Uh We're talking about um, tracking night vision devices uh, uh, to build a criminal case against the illicit transport networks in, uh, into Afghanistan. And then, of course, after these events, uh, uh, <laughs> that became moot by the flooding of U.S. provided uh, night vision <laughs> devices that just flooded the market. Next question, and we're going to lead with Ms. Fontrose, and then I'll ask the other two if they want to do this, is on the role the uh, – soi-disant rapprochement, that's a lot of French, but the self-styled um, rapprochement uh, between Iran and the Gulf states. Um, is it a real thing? Uh, does it show, you know, the fact that the Gulf states seem to be um, coming to their own arrangements with Iran, that, that perhaps the United States' role is uh, diminished or irrelevant? Uh, what, what are we to make of it? Uh, Ms. Fontenrose? I don't see it really as a as a partnership that's in any way threatening to the U.S. relationship with uh, with Saudi or the Gulf. Um, I think it's a non-aggression pact. And I think neither side had to compromise anything to form the deal. And while it's a positive symbol of their willingness to reduce tensions, I don't really expect much of it. There's not any trust. Both sides are hedging. Iran is hedging against the development of a Saudi-Israel strategic relationship, and Saudi is hedging against U.S. withdrawal from or inaction in the region. So I think Saudi thinks it will get a few things. Assurances that Iran will not attack, but Iran never attacks them directly. Assurances that Iran will press Syria to stop exporting Captagon. But how much sway does Iran really have on this? And will they even try? You know, Assad relies on that trade for quite a bit of his is uh, funding and assurances that the Houthis and the PMFs in Iraq will not attack. But again, they can without Iran's direction. Um, though right now the Houthis are more focused on internal Yemeni attacks against the STC and the official government. So I think we can expect Saudi to be disappointed. Iran has been rearming the Houthis since the ceasefire expired yes. last fall. They previously, we saw them create new groups in Iraq to evade sanctions or create plausible deniability when the international community was focused on particular groups inside Iraq with Iranian support. So they have ways of kind of working around any promise they make not to be involved in attacks on Saudi if those should happen again. So not much in it for Saudi, in my opinion, really, when it comes down to brass tacks. And then on Iran's side, their purpose is to drive a wedge between the U.S. and Saudi. I mean, they have a stated foreign policy goal of driving the U.S. out of the region. They're very upfront about it. They're very clear about it. We should respect that. And uh, this is one of the ways they're attempting to do that. They, um, they're taking the threat out of any Saudi, any Saudi Israel relationship as well that could develop behind the scenes by holding, keeping Saudi at a table where their promises are also not to be the launching point for any attacks on Iran or the overflights of any Israeli airships that would, aircraft that would be used to attack Iran. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see a whole lot. I mean, you can set up embassies in each country, both of which will just be filled with intelligence operatives doing on the ground attempts at either asset building or monitoring. Respect that. That's as old as time. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, we watched China kind of be sprinkled onto the top of this at the very end. And I thought there was an irony in that the country that sells weapons to both sides of that conflict is now somehow the peacemaker. Um, but, uh, but I don't think it does anything to reduce the U.S. relationship with, with Saudi, with the UAE, with the region at all. Um, I, I think that, I think the administration was actually honest when they said, Hey, we support this. We support this agreement. Everyone has said for quite some time, not everyone, but a lot of folks have said for quite some time, look, it's, it's not a bad thing if, if the Gulf states and Iran come to some sort of mutual pact of non-aggression. It doesn't mean they have to be best friends. It doesn't mean Iranian, uh, companies are going to start displacing U.S. firms in their tra in you know their trade relationships, but it does mean that there's perhaps less for Fifth Fleet to have to do all the time, which is not again a bad thing. So I think the U.S. does win a little bit if there is even even momentary de-escalation. Um, 
but I'm not really sure what Saudi gets out of it, to be completely frank. Uh, I still think it's great. Any any moves, any confidence building measures are a good thing uh, as long as you don't let your guard down. Just I'm just start, not yet seeing the benefits um, for Saudi in this. OK, uh, Colonel DeHook or Sheikh Nawaf. I would like to add something. I mean, uh, if, uh, I'll, uh, I mean, you have to look at Iran in a different uh, perspective here. From the Gulf states, if I if I have to pretend um, I'm Sheikh Nawaf right now, <laughs> looking at Iran, Iran is a neighbor is a neighboring country. We have a 90 million Iranians. So we can define those 90 millions by this rogue regime or IRGC. And that's, and the, and the, uh, so that's, that's one point. There is a lot of uh, economic opportunities between Iran as a country and the Gulf states uh, and, uh, and cultural uh, uh, you know, context. So those things uh, from a Saudi foreign policy, they can really discount all that. Definitely they don't like the regime. They don't trust the regime. But that's the one way to put a check on them is through a diplomatic process like this, or what we saw recently, uh, you know, bring China into the mix, reopening the embassies. I mean, the Iranian embassy just opened maybe a month ago in, 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 in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so that's, that's the dynamics here, not just the, the, uh, what the Iranian regime is doing uh, in the neighboring countries. Those people, the people, uh, economic uh, opportunity between those countries, oil production too, oil producing country like them. So they, ha they have a commonality on the oil market. So all that uh, the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia has to weigh in uh, besides the uh, rogue uh, uh, behavior of the Russian, uh, Russian regime, uh, I mean, the Iranian regime in the region. Sheikh Nawaf? Okay. I want to <laughs> talk about the uh, U.S. election coming up. You know, we're into the election cycle. And one of the things I think from a from a regional perspective that makes the United States such a frustrating partner to deal with is that, you know, we have a government that tends to be responsive to its people. And I, I've always argued that, um, and, and I have an article forthcoming on this, that um, the relationship between the United States and its partners in the Gulf is actually based on empathy, but only at the elite level on the American side. And that uh, among the great American public, there's a notable lack of empathy. Uh, and that's why we sometimes get contradictory policy outcomes. Uh, so things like we have a longstanding military relationship with Saudi Arabia, but when JASTA, the act allowing lawsuits against the government waiving sovereign immunity for 9-11 crimes, it passes unanimously because that bifurcated uh, hierarchy of empathy. Um, would any one of the three uh, uh, care to lead off and then I'll call on the rest of you for comments about possible outcomes of the election or how that might affect overall U.S. security in the region? Miss um, Fon Rose, I okay. Oh, no. Colonel DeHook. Okay. No, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert in, uh, you know, even though I live in the U.S. for a long time and watching the U.S. election, man, I, uh, democracy always surprises you. Right, yeah. and and especially in the United States, where you, you you have a veto on 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 elections called electoral votes, right? So that also kind of changed the you know you might be the popular president, but not not becoming the president. That's something different, right? You don't see it anywhere in the world. Uh, I think um, uh, regardless who's in the administration, I mean, it's not a constant, like we said. This is gonna uh, it might have some hiccups. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the the only change I don't see him. Uh, the only change I see in the region, the change where the region realized that uh, uh, they have to do it, uh, they have to contribute to that relationship, they have to hedge the relationship, they have to add to it. But which are they doing from all this uh, all this vision uh, uh, and a new uh, 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 economic opportunities they see in? They open up the uh, diplomatic efforts with with Iran, with China, and uh, all that. So I think that you, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, they have a lot of domestic challenges that ref, uh, that gets re always reflected on the foreign uh, arena, uh, uh, but uh, that remains constant throughout the administrations. Uh, but the difference is uh, the, uh, the 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 region is uh, different; it's uh, reasserting itself, and it's becoming a a, a power uh, that uh, needs to be counted as we move forward. Sheikh Nawaf, any thoughts, fears, anticipations, or expectations from the election? Well, no, no fears, I would think. I think, uh, you know, generally speaking and historically speaking, um, national interest kind of transcends uh, administrations. I mean, there were a couple of maybe uh, exemptions to that, that, that kind of that, uh, that rule. But generally speaking, that's the case or has been the case historically. I mean, democracies are messy. 
And yeah. it's, uh, you know, the democratic process, it's beauty in America, at least from an outsider, it's in its messiness. And uh, to the extent that it would affect, um, you know, foreign policy and, and defense policy is, is to be seen. But to be honest, we look at the U.S. presence in, in you know, on a global scale. It's a, you know, it's a U.S.-based interest presence. So CENTCOM did not draw its AOR based on what the countries wanted, but what the U.S. wanted. So even the discussion about will the U.S. move or leave or change, it's, it's a U.S. imperative to secure U.S. interest in, uh, you know, CENTCOM AOR or European uh, command AOR and, and so on and so forth. So on that scale, I don't see a, a big shift in policy when it comes to defense and security, whether for the region or globally. But then again, as I said, to every rule, there's an exemption. So we'll see. <laughs> you know, you, you remind me of Bismarck's comments that uh, laws are like sausage. And if you enjoy them, you shouldn't watch them being made. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the United States as as not just an open democracy, but I would, I would argue a, a rather uh, exhibitionist democracy uh, is is a slaughterhouse with glass walls, a sausage factory with glass walls. Ms. Fontenrose? Uh... I think one thing that surprises folks abroad often is that Americans simply do not vote on foreign policy. It barely even rises on their radar during um, during yeah. elections. And it's sort of embarrassing, but it's true. And uh, and campaigns pay attention to this. So, for instance, the the presidential campaigns right now, most of them have not even hired their national security staffs. They are not writing foreign policy platforms. And their argument is that on the Republican side, at least different on the Democrats because of Biden being the incumbent, um, is that. They their concern is they have to get on the debate stage. You have to have a certain level of polling numbers to be invited mm -hmm. to one of the debates and the debates make a difference in whether you get into a primary. So they are focused on debate stage prep. And they said the first several debates aren't going to be about foreign policy. So they're not even thinking about it yet. Uh, so that should tell you something about how little we know about where these things will shape out. But there are some things we I alluded to when I did my opening comments is that there are some issues that are bipartisan and won't change. Things like the the pressure to compete with and counter Chinese influence will not change. So pressure on our partners will not change. Um, the steadfast support for a relationship with Israel will not change. Um, so expectations about uh, about two state solutions will not change. Uh, the the importance of maintaining counter terrorism and countering violent extremism kind of goals and and building on what we've done and sort of um, inoculating the world's population against potential uh, development of new terrorists, you know, these things that have different language in different administrations, but that will not change. And working with our partners on those will be a, a still a, a preferred goal, a uh, favorite goal of any administration. Um, but one thing to remember is that the U.S. economy is really what Americans vote on. So no matter who comes in, you'll see pressure on keeping oil prices low. You'll see um, pressure on creating jobs for Americans, so not cutting off markets for Americans, on maintaining the dollar as the primary currency of world trade. Those things will not change. Uh, and I think with understanding of these bipartisan issues, governments around the region can really do a pretty good job of creating their own positioning toward America, no matter who comes into office. Yeah. Well, th thank you for, for that point. That's always something to keep in mind. Um, the National Council uh, will have this broadcast uh, slightly edited on and will tweet it. I, of course, uh, will tweet it out as well at DV DeRoche. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a couple of things that have been raised in the course of the discussion that I think the National Council or myself will add to it. The first is... Um, uh, Dr. Colin Call, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, his address at the Manama Dialogue last December, where he quite frankly um, uh, told the, particip the participants, he said, look, you are a sovereign nation, you have sovereign interests, I understand that, but so does the United States, and here's what they are. Uh, that's worth doing. Um, Kirsten has written a recent article on some of the issues discussed here for the Atlantic Council, which we'll tweet out as that. And then finally, behind me, you see the current issue of Middle East policy, which is one of the more expensive academic journals, but uh, the lead article deals with the U.S. presence in the Gulf. It's free until uh, the 16th of July, and uh, I, I will tweet out a link for that as well. I'm, I'm actually one of the participants in there, so you can, in that discussion, so you can, 
uh, critique at leisure. Uh, with that, uh, it's time to first off thank our hosts and the man whose vision created the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, uh, the, the person who brought us all together here, and to throw over for closing remarks to the founding president of the National Council of U.S. Arab Relations, uh, our patron and a man whom we've all benefited from, Dr. John Duke Anthony. Dr. Anthony, thank you for having us today. Uh, can I be heard? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I think the 800-pound uh, gorilla <clears throat> that has been in this room but unacknowledged <clears throat> is, is Palestine. <clears throat> uh, uh, Kirsten, in her early remarks, talked about the United States uh, pushing itself out of the region or being pushed out of the region. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, Palestine in the sense that uh, people's actions have a lot to, uh, attitudes rather, have to do with their actions. People's uh, attitudes have a lot to do with uh, policies. People's uh, attitudes have a lot to do with positions. And so with regard to Palestine, uh, the United States uh, is guilty of shooting itself in the foot and uh, reloading faster than any anyone else. Uh, you don't necessarily win friends uh, and partners and allies if you frustrate your friends. Um, I'm old enough and young enough to have been in Saudi Arabia when the Chinese uh, uh, CSS uh, uh, to uh, the East Wind missile uh, was uh, provided to Saudi Arabia that could go 3,000 miles and strike Tehran. Uh, this was uh, near the end of the uh, Iran-Iraq war, the first of the Gulf Wars per se, that when we had delayed for months and months and months on end uh, the uh, Saudi Arabian request uh, to have a harpoon missile which would have had but a fraction of, of the distance uh, compared to the Chinese uh, missile. And the reason we had kept delaying and delaying and delaying was another, none other than, than Israel and the Israeli lobby that did not want to provide this kind of advanced uh, missile uh, weaponry to Saudi Arabia. Uh, the U.S. Uh, was angry that the Saudi Arabians did this without consultation and uh, with the uh, uh, allegedly without consultation with the United States. Uh, but the Saudi Arabian response was, look, we've been asking you for more than a year uh, for this equipment. What do you expect? Uh, two and two equals four, uh, that we would do what we have to do in our national security and, and national defense uh, interests. Uh, so the U.S. ambassador uh, was unfortunately uh, uh, demanded by the Department of State to go in and uh, issue a démarche uh, to the Saudi Arabian government for doing this uh, with, without, so to speak, uh, permission. Uh, and the ambassador was thereupon de de declared PNG. In other words, the audacity. Of, of you indicating uh, what is going to be our national security, defense, and related interests. Uh, we don't do that with regard to yourselves. In Israel, your, your favorite uh, treasured uh, partner, uh, uh, di diplomatically, defense-wise, financially, strategically, intelligence and technology and otherwise. And so uh, we're not going to take it from you either. Uh, so that was way back then. And that gave a green light to China to look for openings where the United States uh, would do something remotely comparable. In other words, you don't antagonize your allies. You, you don't uh, ask and try to twist arms uh, for your allies to come on board with the Abraham Accords. And at the same time saying that the United States major priority interests are human rights. Uh, when the response would be, what about human wrongs? Uh, you talk about human rights. Uh, you're a signatory to the UN Charter by, by, tre by treaty. You're a signatory to the Four Geneva Convention by, by treaty. Uh, there, and these preclude by international law 
uh, what the favorite country that you're doing uh, is doing uh, almost daily uh, to the people who are being occupied. The Palestinians don't occupy an inch of Israeli territory. It's all the other way around. And if you wonder about the Syrian-Soviet uh, relationship, you might look at uh, not uh, what is wrongly called the Golan Heights, it's the Golan province uh, that the Israelis in uh, June of 67 uh, took two-thirds of Syria's richest province. It's not just the Heights. On his deathbed, then Defense uh, Secretary Israeli Moshe Dion said, this stuff that we took it for security reasons, in essence, was bullshit, using diplomatic language here. Uh, we took it simply because we wanted it. And th this is where Israel then got its wine industry. This is where in Israel then got its ski industry. This is where Israel then su significantly augmented its water supply. All the while, no punitive uh, response from the United States, uh, while at the same time, out of the other side of its mouth, uh, talking about uh, human rights. And on the democracy front, uh, let's be frank, facts are facts. Facts are stubborn things. Uh, the United States is not a democracy. Never has been one. It's a republic. Uh, three branches of government. Okay. Judiciary, legislative, and executive. Uh, we've yet to become a democracy. Uh, and if you wanted to push uh, that button further, you could say, if you were Sheikh Nawaf, I would be tempted to say, wait a minute, in the last quarter of a century, you've had two national elections where the person who got the most votes lost. What kind of a government is that? You call that representative democracy? And there may be yet uh, another challenge coming up in 2024, uh, where in the last election, Arabs and Muslims worldwide, and those in this particular region, were dragged through the mud of, uh, of American jingoism and racism, structured and systemic. And not to mention uh, Qatar uh, having held the FIFA without blemish, without incident, and yet being smeared almost daily through the mainstream American mainstream mission about its shortcomings on human rights and labor rights, etc. I've been going to, to Qatar for more than 50 years, and I can say that Qatar's human rights and labor rights situation is higher or number one amongst all six of the GCC countries. And in terms of not antagonizing an ally, look, I mean, no other country on the planet could have done uh, what Americans more need to be aware of and appreciative of in terms of what illusion has already been made, where 120,000 people were evacuated from Kabul, not just Americans, not just uh, Afghans, but uh, people from all other kinds of nationalities. Why? Because only Qatar of all the world's countries had the aircraft that could do this, had the air airfields that could handle that kind of aircraft, that could have the accommodations, the barracks and the food and the logistical provisions uh, to deal with these people whose lives had been smashed along with their dreams, to smithereens. And so one can expect this kind of racism, uh, core anti-Arabism, core anti-Muslim uh, sloganeering in the election to come. We're still in an odd number year. We've still got about seven months yet to go. It's the even-numbered years where in the United States, the political system shows itself with reason and logic, and rationale, taking a backseat in emotionalism and racism and jingoism and naked, bald-faced patriotism going to the forefront and singing mudded Arabs and Muslims. 
uh, there's this aspect. Don't push. Don't don't frustrate your friend. Don't provoke your partner. Don't antagonize your, your ally. Don't move them to abide by America's national needs, national concerns, national interests, national objectives, without being requisitely empathetic to their needs. As Sheikh Nawaf said in his remarks about the respect for national sovereignty, uh, two sides of the same coin, as their sovereignty is no less cherished and sacred and sacral sanct than America's national sovereignty. End of points. Thank everybody for being part of this cerebral massage. And I um, hope that all of us have learned something and that our knowledge and understanding has increased. Uh, inf information has expanded. And so has our insight. And as a result of all four of these forces, factors, phenomena, each and every one of us is more equipped to analyze the issues, the trends, the challenges, the issues, the opportunities more critically, more responsibly than before we began two hours ago. Thank you, everyone. Eid al Masalama. All the best. Goodbye. Okay, are we off? Are we off, Roland? Sheikh Nawaf, can you 